in you. And one of the things, you know, I coined the term back in 92, post-slavery trauma syndrome. And many people have been dealing with the term, but they miss the point. See, if you are an African, and somebody took you out of Africa, and turned you into something else, you're not going to be free until you become the thing that you were before they turn you into something else. And we are still, even though you say they're conscious, they're still afraid of being an African. Nice. Even if that word is not the word you want to use, still they sit out of the window. Pick another word that means the same thing. Right. You know? And we haven't yet decided that we don't want to be the white man in black face. And that's where the problem with white supremacy lies. You want to be the white woman in black face. You're not going to be successful. You will never be free except to be an African again. If you're not an African again, you're just a thing, uh, a hologram of somebody else's culture. Come on. And that's all you're going to be. All right. And you may have some money. You got folks out here with money. You may have some. And it doesn't mean a thing. We spent a trillion dollars last year. And we still look like the bombs in the world. So that doesn't mean very much. So it isn't really about the money. I didn't totally agree with some of what was discussed in terms of the economic piece. I'm a hell of a lot more radical than that. And for those who know it, I believe you got to diss everybody. Yes. You got to diss the hell with the Arab brother. The hell with oh, yeah. Be very clear. I'm going to tell the hell Don't say, bro. I'm all about the hell with the Latin brother. The hell with the Asian brother. Right. The hell with the white brother. Right. Until they give a damn about us. Now, if you got some problem with that, then you really don't want to free to be free. Right. Because you can understand what's going on. This is about food, clothing, shelter, and safety. If you can't provide food, clothing, shelter, safety to yourself and your family, you're the prisoner of those who can do that. Okay. And you got to be real clear. To, to be able to provide that, you got to control the economics, you got to control, control the politics, and you got to control the culture where you live. Now, one brother, good brother, and I know he went well into peace, and then I'm going to step up and take your question. He was saying that, the, you know, the brothers, every culture have made it by having this period where they're gangsters. Well, if you want to be what the white man is, then you need to do that shit. Mm. But that's not how we built our civilization. And that's not how we're going to rebuild our civilization. So let's not get it twisted like this thing that's supposed to be saying out there. We, we've had gangsters from time immemorial. I'm actually working with some of the people right now in Bumpy Johnson's life. Trying to look at the aspect of Bumpy that wasn't gangster. Trying to look at the Geechee culture that formed the consciousness he was forced to be a gangster. Most of us are not forced to be gangsters. Most of us are imitating white people that think that's appropriate because we can subdue and abuse the weakest and the most vulnerable in the black community. We're not out there robbing white folks. We're not selling dope to white folks. Right. We're not extorting white folks. We're extorting, selling drugs, and beating up on the most vulnerable in the black community that the white man has already beaten down until they can't stand up there. That's not a gangster. It's a parasite. I get confused. Now you want to be a gangster. Matt Turner was a gangster. Right. Oh, Praise him. Okay. Lucky Luciana wasn't destroying the taxes. Lucky He's Luciana like, was destroying the Jews and the Walsh and the Irish oh. who was messing with the damn Italians. Y'all understand that a lot of us hold these guys up. You know, Costello. He was a gangster in our eyes, but he was a hero in Italian eyes. I knew I met Carlo Gambino. Sat at his side, but his nephew got married. Castellano's son, Tony. Because I refused to kiss his damn ring. He waxed in his wedding. I ain't kissing his ring. Everybody was panicking. I said, no, so the old man had the conversation. I said, James, I understand you come sit beside me. So I said, that there was monster. Everybody kissing his ring because he was God there. All they were saying is that you are chief, you are friends. You are emperor because you protect us, the Italian. You protect us economically, you protect us culturally, and you give money to the Catholic Church to protect us spiritually. We don't understand what being gangsters is all about. 
gangs of the revolutionary for their people. Right. They're not parasites and predators on their people. So I just want that straight because I don't want to be a part of the documentary where the wrong message go out and think I approve it because I don't. And some of you really don't know much about this, so you need to wear a bio on me. I'm a DT, Gullah man, South Carolina, grew up in a place called Georgetown, South Carolina, down in between Charleston and Murphy Beach. And we some bad folks, we all carry knives, I didn't bring mine today. I <laughs> man doing the night for swing with But at 16, I met this brother named Malcolm X, because I thought he was the baddest dude on planet Earth. Mm. At 21, he had been assassinated, and I became the minister over his mosque. I'm the successor. Now, I don't blow that out to make names for myself. Those who know me, know me. Asana Shakur, the queen of the Black Liberation Army, the last day she spent in Hummel before she had the baby in Cuba, I would walk in with her as a part of her security. That's what I'm talking about. who didn't have a sense of black consciousness, but professed a black identity, allied themselves with the Zionist enemy, and destroyed the black base throughout City University in New York. So we need to start thinking before we get caught up on somebody else's ideology on how to behave and what to accept. Because I know what's real. So I let her at her work this morning. She's the other half of what's real. And without me and her, life ends. I hope y'all get it, you brother, you think? You brothers can pack all you want to pack, but you don't even know I'm going to go to a cemetery. And your sisters can kiss all your brothers' heads, but you don't even know I'm going to go to a cemetery. If you're going to perpetuate this race, then you have to see that when we talk about that model of a star, a set, and a root, what we are talking about is the family as the foundation of civilization. That's right. There's nothing to do with no damn God and goddesses and the sex you're looking at. You're the God and the goddesses when you behave in according with the laws of nature that allow you to perpetuate and recreate yourself over and over again. The culture of Africa, I'm also a priest of the yoga tradition. Very proud of that. I'm also a priest of the movie tradition. Very proud of that. Because until we go back to our own stuff, no modification of the white stuff oh, is going to free your life. Man. And that's really the problem. So we need to make sure that we are trying to survive America. And some of us all have to remember we had a song in the 60s, Who Will Abide America? Very few niggas, no crackers at all. And that's still true. And don't worry about that word. The white folks created a discussion to distract you about a decade ago around the word nigga. And they got you discussing a word based on what they want you to think the word should mean to your consciousness, and you forgot, forgot to discuss the cracker who created the environment to even allow the word to be used that way. So what you just saw when we were discussing white supremacy, we're talking about something, you can find it in the book, there's a new book out, you need to write this book down and lock it in your mind. It's called The Island of Meme, The Island of M-E-F-E, -E, and it's by Dr. Wade Nobles. And what the book is about, he uses the Haitian Revolution and the Haitian people as the prototype for all black revolutions and all black people, mind condition. And what he's saying, is that the way we think is a result of how we got our information, and that information that we got that influenced how we think came from a formulation of somebody else's idea of how information should be formulated to your mind. Yeah. That's the me. You know? Some of us are here brothers. Now, I taught at a college for like 20 something years, but I don't use big words like paradigm and stuff like that. I try to keep stuff simple, you know. But the word paradigm that we hear, you go on the internet, and the blah, blah, blah. all the hell that means is where did you learn to think 
the way you think. Where did you learn and how did you learn to formulate thoughts the way you do? And if the value you put on things as a result of your thought formulation didn't come from your ancestors, mm. it came from your Don't enemy. Because right. any thought you hold is your enemy's attack on your psyche. Mm -hmm. And then your actions take it into the So this is really about becoming African again. It has never changed until you restore it to what you were before that cracker came to that continent, you will not be free. <laughs> that was one little piece of the religion thing that we were dealing with it in there, and we didn't deal with the Islamic part, you know, that was the Muslim for many years, 18 years, that was an email, that was the largest Muslim community in America. And y'all don't even know my name. I went to Mecca before most of you in this room were born. And then when I saw what I saw, I made that decide I'm leaving. Even though Islam, like Christianity, is born out of the bowels of Kemet. And Kemet is not an anomaly unto itself. Kemet is born out of Congo, Uganda, and Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. We get caught up in what happened in the desert, but that was like our repository. Tens of thousands of years of civilization happened before Kemet was born. So this is the place where the ecology allowed for the preservation of so much useful information that we can use to help us reconstruct ourselves. So today, in this world, in this America, in this Western Holocaust, we have to figure out what we're going to do. Are we only interested in being good white people? Because there's no such thing. So the whole civilization is predicated on murder and genocide of other people. And in order for us, to acquire what white America has, to build what they've built here. We gotta find some black folks in Africa, enslave them for 500 years, murder them, 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 and destroy them for that period of time, steal a whole continent from another people, genocide them, then we can build this. If you wanna follow his blueprint. But if you're not gonna follow his blueprint and you can, you better find a your shit. We said we pull libations to our ancestors, we run down to the beach, once a year, we're white for the ancestors. You are the damn ancestors. Mm -hmm. There's no ancestors other than you. Yep. So come away from that Christian illusion of putting God up there and God not there and yes. Right. You want the libation to yourself. Mm -hmm. Everybody in here is a compilation of all of the DNA that ever existed in the line that you are from the time you broke away from the thing you call the divine. And you didn't break away from it. You just an expression of an aspect of his essence, having the peculiar experience that you are. You all got that? That's called African spirituality. That's spookality. That's reality. We are the best of our ancestors' genes. We are the latest tech version and the highest tech model until we give our children that same thing. That's the ancestor that you're born to. You're born to your own consciousness. You're talking to your own inner soul. You're talking to your own heart to take action on your behalf up, up above and beyond what your intelligence or consciousness will allow you to do. You okay? Yes, sir. And it's important because I don't want to come up here and just talk yada 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 about we see the shit and then we walk out here. I got guns. I want one. Can you give me Girl, get yourself a gun and let me do that shit. <laughs>
for yeah. something that made you so sick mm. that the people who butcher you every day, mm. when one of them fall after killing a thousand of you, you cry. Mm. Stop being so foolish. I hate celebrating. Now, the secret to life is to have no fear. Not a damn soul in this room is going to get out of this world like these bodies. You're going to shed these bodies. So make the shedding of it work.
because we have many problems. These problems are in layers. And I want to start first by um, saying that it's an honor and a privilege for me to be on the panel with such great luminaries, such as uh, Professor James Smalls, the Eritini Genie, and my brother from another, Brother Red Pill. You know, that's an honor and a privilege. But I know that this is not just a privilege, but an opportunity to come before the people to build up a very, very, very critical and pertinent topic matter. Today's subject is, are black people under attack? I mean, we know we are. The question's almost rhetorical because we know we're under attack. But understanding the dynamics of those attacks, the layers of those attacks, the covert, the overt, you know what I'm saying? What we're facing and, and, and a strategy to counter that is what the whole premise of these dialogues are to be. It's about problem resolution. That is the purpose of knowledge. Like Dr. John Amos, I mean, Dr. Uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, sorry, Dr. Amos Wilson said in the blueprint for black power. So what we have to do is really come together with a resolute blueprint for black power and problem resolution. Because if not, then we you know we have no future for our children's children's children to look forward to. You know, so I want to kind of, you know, we have to go into putting things in their proper perspective. I mean, this is the information age. So information is always so much information. It's like information indigestion. <laughs> if you can just turn on uh, the social media and just get a, a smorgasbord of information about every topic, everything, pseudo information, accurate information, is just all mixed all up. Right. But what we have to do is eat the fish and spit out the bones with a lot of information. We need to use the information that is going to be geared towards manifestable reality changes for us. You know, we have to organize and utilize this information to make transitions in real time to impact change that is critically needed and long overdue. Because if not, then we are aiders and betters in our own demise if we claim to be conscious, but we're only conscious in theory, but not proactive, only reactive. You know, so I learned in my journey, because you know, everything is evolutionary, everything, everything is a process, you know? I used to do martial arts, you start off as a white belt, white, you know, destitute of color and everything, and as you, the more disciplined, the stronger you get, okay, even wisdom, that you get about how to fight, you develop and, you know what I'm saying, you got different hues of colors that you represent on in your belt. It shows that growth and transition, elevation is taking place. The same thing has to, or the same attitude can correlate in consciousness. The information that we obtain, okay, we start off on these levels to this. A lot of people want to read a few books, learn a few big words, get a couple of new concepts, go on a hunk and a dashiki, and go crazy. And then what happens, a lot of them get discouraged when they see that the expectation that they have for a romantic perception of consciousness, they burn out. There's no longevity. Ah, I knew this shit gonna work. I tried that conscious stuff. Now I'm going back to church. <laughs> yeah, this is crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what we have to do is we have to be realistic with this. We have to understand that it's an evolutionary process and it's a developmental process. You know what I mean? Everybody develops and evolves at different levels because we are different. You know? And one thing I've been learning that I've been getting, I uh, started off through the school of Islam as a youth. Then I even went to the school of the Hebrew Israelite. My thing was into uh, dogma and theology then. My grandfather was a reverend, so I was brought up in the church. And hearing him preach, it just never sat right in me. Looking at that white Jesus on the wall that looked like Charles Manson. Because, you know, I was young and I was out with the this dude, you know? <laughs> Something about the Beatles and the hell of the skeleton. I was like, wow, why he look just like Charles Manson, you know? And then I'm looking at the black people there, he didn't reflect that. You know, and I used to be like, damn, even as a young man, a, a hint of radicalism in my spirit. I understand why that was there now, but I understand what the purpose I was born for during my journey. I discovered that. But back then, at that point, I would be like, damn, if the white man on earth is giving us hell, imagine if one of them was to come from the skies, from <laughs> heaven, to return back. Imagine what kind of hell we were in. That was just my rationale as a kid. I didn't know why I thought that. I wasn't really a student of knowledge of history. I mean, I knew that I had a problem with the things that I've seen, narratives, documentaries, and things that I've seen in history book as it related to our, the condition of our people and the trauma that our people suffered here in the hells of North America. But as a young person, I noticed that I had that hint of radicalism in me. 
So therefore, I was attracted to theology, uh, black nationalist perspective of theology, because that was my first exposure to anything as far as uh, what you would so-called religious or spiritual, my grandfather was a reverend. But on that journey, as I evolved, as I brought in my school through commitment to um, optical research and study, you know, I started to broaden my scope and say, this is beyond religion. We have to have a spiritual premise, but it should be rooted in our ancestral greatness of who and what we are. That is part of us being liberated. We could take the white man's version of Jesus and, and or his concept and story and put a black face on it. It's like having a black man on a cream of wheat box. You still don't want a company, just a black face on it. It's just like how back in the day when they would have albums in the 1940s and 50s, you know what I'm saying? Or the black voice singing and all that, but you had to put a white representative on the cover, or you couldn't have a black face on the album back then. You know, we just did a reverse with that with religion. We just painted a lot of the concepts and the ideas of the white man black. But I learned that we had to transcend that. We had to get deeply rooted into who we are, what we ought to be, okay? And we had to navigate backwards through that. That's why I changed my name to Sankofa. And I started to do the research, and I studied Islam very swift in the scriptures when I was a Hebrew Israelite and going into the Hebrew language, but I always had an attraction to study of history. I always felt like there was something else missing. And then that led me into my journey as I disciplined like the karate, going from a white belt up to a higher degree, or in this case, uh, from whiteness, being brainwashed and whitewashed into a highest consciousness to the highest level, for instead of a black belt, black consciousness is where I'm at with it now. And now I'm fighting white lies with all the discipline and the knowledge and the information that I have now. You know what I'm saying? I'm using that, okay, as a spoke in the wheel because I don't claim to have the message. I always like to use the term, the lightning in the bottle, and I don't claim to. But what I do have is my sincerity, my zeal for information, and my unrelenting desire to see our people free by any means necessary, even if it means my life in the process. That's what I believe in. That's what I stand for. That's what my religion, if you want to call it, is. Black nationalism and pan-Africanism to the death, you know? And we have to ask ourselves, are black people? That is my religion, you know? To do that, I will have eternal life. Through the children, my children's 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 children, and in this time space continuum called life, that I was a contributor to the advancement through breaking the shackles, okay, that were placed on us psycho-spiritually, okay, by the institutions of white supremacy, academically, spiritually, and otherwise. You know, uh, we always say the same. The most important, so two most important times in your life is when you were born and you found out why you were born. You know, I found out why I was born at an early age, but still maturity, developing, shedding old ways, transcending right. the bigger mentality. Yeah, I was going through that too. You know what I'm saying? And as I evolved and grew, I grew into who I am. And who I am is only a process of me being who I am, only to become who I am predestined or destined to become. This is a process. And I'm in this to the depth. Because black people, we do have problems. We are under attack. The initial flyer read all black people under attack. Be damn right. We have been. And, it, and, it, and it's deep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's deep. The, the level we know that white supremacy is real. But what they plan on doing is eradicating us, depopulating us, so severe that to the point where 100 years from now, like I always say, and you've probably heard me say before, we're going to be like fossils and a goddamn museum somewhere. Right. The homosexual agenda. You know what I'm saying? The FEMA camps that they have set up. You know what I'm saying? The miscegenation that they promote over the air cover. The home, you know what I'm saying? The homosexual agenda. If I didn't say it before, I was saying that. If I can say it, I'm say it again. The homosexual agenda. That's one of the things, because depopulation is necessary for them to exist long term. Extraminimally or globally, the Caucasian only makes up, what, 8% of the world population? One ninth? Wow. One ninth of the world, and if the first law of nature is self-preservation, white supremacy is his self-preservationist right. type of tactic and agenda. Right. So they're putting information in you to put inspiration in you to cause you to stand up. 
Okay? And man up and stand up. Wake up and clean up. This is what we have to do. Because we have a lot of the problems. But our own self-hatred and lack of principled unity is a main contributor to our collective problems as well. Our ignorance is the greatest weapon that the enemy has in his hands against us. Our own ignorance. If we wake up, we start to pool our resources. We start to pool our uh, ingenuity because we have nationalism at the root of what we do, we'll see a lot of these problems dissipate and change. Yes, everything is the process. It took a process to get us to this point of being mental homeborn slaves and comfortable under the paradigm of white supremacy, but it's also gonna be a process, a committed one and a conscious one to transcend that, to break the shackles and to move forward so we can connect what our inevitable divine rendezvous with destiny. You know? So it's about exposing contradictions and it's about building a blueprint to empower us to move up so we can um, mobilize forward as a people. You know? That's what this is all about. This information isn't just to feel good. You know, even though we should feel good with the information. I'm not gonna say don't feel good, but we don't want it to be limited to that. You know, we want to look at this on a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted levels of what this information is geared towards doing, the potential that is geared towards doing, what our kids, kids, the bloodline will be stronger with the information that we're acquiring, inquiring, I mean, acquiring now, excuse me, okay, that we're learning and that we're teaching our children. Do you know how powerful that's going to be down the line? So we got to treat this as such. We got... Jews, we got gems, we got the information that we have now is that what's going to be once it's manifested into a practical type of thing that is going to change the paradigm and the circumstances of us. Because we know we have problems, and the biggest problem, of course, is white supremacy, but with assist and aids and events, that white supremacy agenda and the maintenance of it is our ignorance and our self-hatred. You know what I mean? Some of us are consciously like that. Some of us are unconscious of aiders and abettors and supporters of global and institutional white supremacy. Some of us are even gatekeepers of it. So the change starts with, from within, individually. That's where revolution starts. And then it spreads abroad. Individually, okay? Then it turns to a community. Then it turns to nationwide. And then we look at it on an international level. You know what I mean? Hey, we have geniuses out there. Look at the negative images they put out here. You know what I'm saying? Then that's purposely done. So what your children see of themselves and as it's reflected through media, through billboards and other narratives, is negative. So they want to imitate and perpetuate that cycle of niggerism. You know what I'm saying? Negativity, not just negativity, negativity. You see what I'm saying? But we have to counter that by giving the kids right now, because it's a battle for the hearts and minds of the people. You know, you have a person, a young brother, they never put this in the video, all the negative stuff they want to put. Know your man March. We was there. Um, um, uh, yeah, Eric Jean, we was there last uh, October 10th. Yeah, 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 besides what it was or what it wasn't, I'm just saying there wasn't no fights, no outbreaks, or over a million black people that came together. Okay, yeah, there could have been some work done after that. It could have been rooted into something more uh, beneficial long term. However, there was no media coverage and a positive thing. All them blacks come together, they said all them blacks can kill each other. Y'all are your own worst enemy. But that day there was no drama, no chaos, nobody got arrested, no news coverage. Here it is, you got Ramani Wilfred, um, a young brother who was 11 years old at the time, who is uh, from an uh, IQ society called Mensa, which is um, in uh, London, England which is the oldest and most prestigious IQ society, so-called, in the world. Here it is, out of Steve Hawkins, Bill Gates, and um, um, Steve Hawkins, it was it Bill Gates, and what's the other guy? Einstein. Uh, and Albert Einstein, which scored all 160 on an IQ test. This one 11-year-old black boy, 11 years old, scored 162, put him in the top 1% in the world. But you don't hear about that on the news. But this is what we got to keep out here. This is what we got to stay in our children. Because they don't want to emulate that. So I want to say keep teaching, keep waking up, and uh, the sky's not even the limit. In fact, the limit's not even the limit. Black power.
brothers and sisters and my wife here. Can we show them some love? This is a serious commitment. I want to do something like that again. And I'm going to tell you real quick, if I just confess as far as I didn't tell you, is that, you know, when we got to Bermuda, see, he's a very sophisticated brother. When we got to Bermuda, there was a lot of things. I've never been in this kind of situation. So we had to go to a radio station, and the first thing the sister said is, say, look, we know what you are going to talk about tomorrow. We don't want to talk about nothing about the homosexual agenda or any of that type of stuff. So I was kind of stuck, and I'm sitting in my mind going, what am I going to do now? And everybody that was calling was doing that, but it was the best situation in the world. Because I watched the OG for two hours. I mean, he had like, he was playing Batman with these folks. Pow, pow, pow. I'm just sitting there, I said, wow, it was the best thing in the world. I didn't get a knockout on the radio, and I didn't say one word for two hours. And the next day we did the lectures, and the people loved it. He brought them all in. And after they started putting it out in the paper how bad things were going, who was it? Everywhere we went, the black folks were scared and looking at me like a demon. And after two minutes, of Professor Swall, oh, let me talk to the labor union. My grandfather was in the labor And by the time he finished, they were shaking my hand and smiling. I said, wow, I want to hurt. I want to be with this brother everywhere he goes. <laughs> so let me just tell you, this is real. I see it in real time. This brother knows how to maneuver in this system to work for our people. And I want to thank him for all that he's done for me with that. I want to get to the main part of all the other uh, seeds, and I want to say there are four main things that I say that they're doing right now to our race that I'd like to talk about very briefly, list them, and then I'll pass the mic on. Number one, the homosexual agenda, the homophile agenda. The object is this, and if, if this one wins, the other three don't matter. From the European perspective, if they can take our sons and daughters and turn our sons into our daughters and our daughters into our sons and sexually violate our children, if they can get us to sit idly by and allow our children to be sexually destroyed, those generations that come behind that are already dead. Mm. There's no reason for any other further genocide. If a generation of Africans worldwide are sexually destroyed, we've already lost. There's nothing else we to talk about. All right. So, no, it's not the only thing we're facing, but it's a battle that we absolutely, positively, beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt, must win. There's no negotiation in it. We have to stop the sexual abuse of our people, right. which leads to the sexual confusion, which leads to the homosexuality, right. and the rape, and the perversion in our community that is destroying the morals and ethics and the self-esteem of our people. Mm. It's an absolute must in the story. So that's one. Number two, and I'm not saying these are in any order. Number one is number one, but these next three are just all three things that they're doing. Number, another thing that they're doing is interracial things. Yes. If we look Sick. historically, one of the ways that they have destroyed, somebody just said Haiti. Why is it that Haiti has not taken over North America? Who was it that betrayed the Haitian Revolution? Beyond just the basic Mobutu, the mulatto class. Why historically has the European created the mulatto class? In ancient Kemet, in Haiti, if you look throughout the world, when they plan a major siege and the destruction of large masses of black people, before they do it, they create a class that creates confusion for us. Because they can look like us one minute, they can look like them the next minute. And historically, not all of them individually, but as a class, the class of mulattoes has sided against African people and have been, as Chancellor Williams said, in the destruction of black civilization, the chief Asian in assisting the destruction of black civilization. So we must now stop all interracial dating. We must make it clear to our race that the only woman, matter of fact, let me show you how you do this. Stand up, sister. That's all I Put us back together 
and stick with this race of men who've fallen and been broken. But your story is that you're supposed to put us back together, so some part of that is a responsibility that you got to take and help us get back right. So is that right, too? Can we clap for that? Mass vaccinations. Mm. Not getting them. This is all they are. All they're doing is saying we'd rather them ask us and allow us to poison them and kill them than fight them. Right. So what they're doing, once they uh, did that original thing in the 1950s where they gave those shots of polio, and those were really shots of polio that he thought, but they were infected. And it took about 25 years for people to die. And they realized, wow, we can inject somebody with something. And then 25, we can calculate how long it'll be before they die. And we can literally, if we take a place of a million people, we can inject them and say in 25 years, we can plan on moving in there because they're going to all be dead. Mm. And so they're doing that around the African world now with corrupt leaders that are allowing them to come in there. And they're doing it to our people here, trying to mandate vaccination, which is nothing but simple. It's poisoning African people and Straight killing up. our people. Straight up. I'm not saying that there are no good vaccinations. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. Don't know. Six month old baby need 25 shots. Crazy. So, I can't tell you which ones to get, which ones not. I'll say this. We need to get our black chemists, the ones we pay and trust, to look at these vaccines, see which ones are good for us and which ones are not, and for the most part, eliminate them from our diet altogether. Yeah. And it's not just that, it's also the foods and things like that. Right, They're that poisoning our people worldwide. That's another major threat. And then the last major threat that I will speak of is just pure unadulterated white aggression, invasion of Africa, murder of black people in the streets, designed to create terrorism, and to make those who are already afraid, afraid enough so that they can turn them against us. Mm. Have you ever seen a black person that's so cowardly and scared that they would get brave enough to fight you yeah. in order not to have to fight white folks? Mm. I'm gonna say that again. You got the courage to stand up to the white folks finally. Say, let's do this. And they have those amongst us who've been psychologically infected with such fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though you got enough courage to vote white folks with me, you must be a real serious black person. You got enough. <laughs> There's something wrong with you if you vote for white folks. And people should leave you alone, but they're so afraid that they will fight you and risk whatever detriment will come to them than to fight for white folks. Mm -hmm. And so now what we see is invasions in Africa. We see invasions in America, murders by the police, turning up getting us used to the idea of masses of black people getting murdered so that when they start murdering more and more and more of our people, when they start invading regions like Nigeria, when they start invading East Africa, when they start the mass murders in the Congo like they're doing over 10 million people, we'll be getting used to this and hating the murders. We'll get used to it and we will no longer resist and, and strike back the way we should. So those are four main things as African people we need to look at to fight. And I'm going to say something. I have to say something. I hope my, my elder won't be upset with you. Know, I'm going to say something might be a little bit different than what was said, but I'm saying it, it, it just, I do what I believe my responsibility is to do. That's who I am. I can't turn it off. I just have to be who I am. Sometimes it don't make me very popular. My wife said it don't never make me very popular. But yeah, don't. I just want to be popular. I will say this. This is coming from me. When I look in that crowd right there, I'm telling you like this. If I thought any one of y'all was a good word, if that's what I thought you were, I would not put my relationship with her on the line with my children. I could be gainfully employed with these crackers right now. I learned to manage this system. I could be making fine. I can't do that because my people are dying. Yes. And I made the decision. It's in me. I'm going to fight. I don't care what the consequences are. Yeah. I'm going to go to the I'm going to my enemy. I'm going to go to the I thought that if any one of y'all was an N-word, I would not do that for you. If I thought my brother right there, with his movie was an N-word brother, I wouldn't put my life on the line for him. I would say, that's my brother, and if you put your hands on him and he's right, you in the war with me too, because I love him, because without him, I can't win. And I look at my sisters here. If I thought that you were one of those things, there's no way in the world I would say, I'm going to be embarrassed and have to fight all of these brothers when I say we got to stop calling our women out of our name. We got to stop complaining about them not supporting us when we got music that calls them out of their name and we haven't gone in and smacked these dudes around and said, every time you make a, a, a record, disrespecting our women, we're going to smack you. If we allow it to happen and allow them to be called thieves and whores their whole life, then we turn around and complain that they're not acting like queens. I say that. I don't know how many other people say that consistently. Why do I do that and take the ridicule from the black men who say, oh, you're a feminist and you know it. I'm a real man. I really have opinion. Until we take the mature position, and it's a hard position, 
to give away any of our identity and who we right. really are. We are the descendant of our African ancestors that were conquered, captured, and enslaved and brought here to the wilderness of North America and around the diaspora of the world and beaten over the course of a few centuries, ma'am, mm. who have the responsibility to recognize that we must not only get ourselves together, but we must seek the most righteous form of vengeance and give to the world that which they deserve for what they have done to our people. I believe that we can only do that in loving who we are all the time. And if I see you as my African brother and sister, I say that that vision of an identity works anywhere on planet Earth. Anywhere, it's the last thing I'm gonna say, I'm gonna pass it. Anywhere you go on the planet, if you look a black man in his face, or a black woman in her face, say, how you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? That works. Right. If you go anywhere and say, this is my black brother, this is my black sister, we in this together, that works 100% of the time. Anywhere you go and say, this is my African brother, on, this is my African sister, right. that identity works, and we can do something with it. So I'm saying, let's get rid of all the other identities. Come on. Let's be brothers and sisters, and let's go to war and win, because I know we can do that. Thank you. But I, that the, what I was saying is that we don't let the enemy frame the discussion. We decide what topics get discussed when. Right. For me, you know, I'm like you. I actually didn't use that word much until lately because it was something that had to be explained. Because he took us off of our game in a discussion that we didn't even need to have because we had already made up our minds about that. What he had done in the media with the little brothers and sisters, he gave that money to to drop that stuff out there in music. That was his attempt at trying to create another language. That's right. And he's doing it to us again. And I'm very hard about this. He can't determine the discussion. He can't frame the discussion. I'm going to read the definition of matter. Because we're going to, really, we're going to briefly talk about what Black Lives Matter is and what this commercialization of consciousness is and what it isn't, all right? And then we'll get into the topic at hand, but the, the topic of this panel discussion is, are we under attack? And if we can identify an organization that was created to usurp the conscious community or a real movement and become a face of a new movement, right? Then we're dealing with infiltration. We're dealing with Cointel Pro 2.0. The Michael Brown Ferguson incident was bankrolled. You gotta remember, there was a 24-hour news cycle that was bankrolled by George Soros and other social entrepreneur, um, social entrepreneur venture capitalists to launch Black Lives Matter. You didn't hear about them prior to an event that they basically bought airtime for. Meaning like, you know, when people buy commercial space, yeah. they bought the news cycle for Ferguson and that's when they were introduced. That's why the brother said he didn't get any airtime to speak because on top of all of the agendas were the groups that were approved and basically brought in to become the new face of the movement. Mm. Now all of our people are running around talking about Black Lives Matter. If you gotta say in the year 2000 that Black Lives Matter, as if we didn't already know that, then you have a problem. You are actually going backwards with your scholarship. Mm. <laughs> Come on, bro. It's real, like. You're going backwards in your scholarship. Crazy. We've been through that. What are you talking about? That's like if all of us signed up to an Ivy League school and then the first day of class, they said one plus two equals one plus one equals two. And if we do it in the bay on that, we yo, wait a minute. Like you're going backwards, but this is a definition of matter real quick. Alright? Because we gotta deal with word magic and the fact that they're dealing with they're letting they're making you identify terms. They're making you run around saying right. things like, I cannot breathe. That's an oxymoron. It's an affirmation that has a negative connotation to it. I cannot breathe. So, breath being the substance of life, 
You affirming 100,000 of us in a melanated sea of blackness, I cannot breathe, telling that to the world. Guess what you're affirming? Mm. Yep. Okay. Yep. Matter. In many occult and Gnostic systems, the antithesis of spirit in the grossest emanation of the Godhead in the process of creation. Occultists generally believe that matter is animated by an inner vibrant force that provides life and dynamism in the universe and that this, this energy is identical in essence to God. Matter is not regarded as reality in, in of, it, of itself, but as the outer form of an inner transcendent process. Among the Gnostics, matter was regarded as evil because of its distance from the spirit. So, if a group of lesbians said that Black Lives Matter, wow. and they're not even procreating, wow. if, a group of le if a group of homosexual men is running around and saying Black Lives Matter, but they don't want a queen next to them, crazy, and they said that they're fighting for the black family, but their mission statement says to dismantle the black family, you are, you are dealing with a level of psychosis that you're not going to be able to get out of for the next 100 years. You're putting yourself in a box. Dang. Facts, facts. The black family is the only thing that matters at this point. That's who the world is. In war, in war, in war, the most coveted prized possession of war is the woman. They've been busting our ass for the last 500 years. Ever since they kicked us out of Spain, ever since they declared revenge on us based on the Pope, the papal bulls said, in short, go ahead by the right of the church, Go and conquer the name in the go and conquer the world in the name of the church and the crown. Meaning that it was called the doctrine of discovery. Meaning wherever the ships pulled up to, you got the Bible in one hand and the musket or the gun in the other or the sword, and you will conquer in that name. And what was the booty of the war? It was a black woman. Right, that's true. Because prior to that, their woman was the prize of the war. That's where that's where the harems and all of that came out of. That's where the mulatto race rose out of. You gotta do your history. You got booty in the Bible too. It's the booty. So they conquered our women. Look at them. Go outside and bed side at night and look at look at what you're gonna see. Go into Harlem at night and look at what you're gonna see. You're gonna see black men acquiescing to the fact that they got conquered by the Romans and they are on their knees to the Romans. You put a homosexual in a room with some white men, and guess what's gonna happen? I'm not even gonna say it because it's children in a room. So you can't have no goddamn homosexual sitting at the table trying to discuss Black Lives Matter to some white men when at the end of the day they wanna be like them. I mean, real, let's be real. Them black homos running around with dashikis, they're not trying to restore African principles to our race, they're not trying to be African again. They are trying to get along inside of Rome by any means necessary. Mm. And that's a fact. Mm. And so are these lesbians. Right. Yeah. They just want to integrate. They want to integrate. They are carrying on the turn the cheek tradition. Right. All right? They are carrying on whoever the homosexual was that was pushing King to do whatever he did. They're trying to carry that on. They want to get along to go along. They don't want to disrupt the system. They want to stop white people from having lunch and tell them Black Lives Matter. That's not revolutionary. All right? We just was walking the other, we were just walking here a few minutes ago and we passed the mural of Yusef Hawkins. That was our Mike Brown, okay? That was our Trayvon Martin, okay? The difference between the generation of now and the generation that existed in Best Eye in the 80s is that they genetically violated us. What do you mean, Brother Red Pill? They have compromised our people through our stock and our genetics. Tariq Nasheed showed that in the film. The difference between us in the 80s and now is not what is, the, what is being done to us, it's the fact that we are not doing what we was doing back in the days right. to the people who was doing shit against us now. Right. That is the only difference. It's the response. Right. Meaning that they compromise the stock of our people. They have weakened our stock. Go outside and look at your people in their face. Go outside. I don't care where you go. Go to Africa. Go to the Caribbean. Go to Ben yeah, Go to Brownsville. Go to Houston. Go to Atlanta. And look at these people. All right? They have genetically modified our people to be weaker. They are culling our people through our genetics. The right. eugenics have taken over through the GMO, through the fluoride, through the chemtrails, through the homosexual.
a stop. I came from Louis Louisville, Kentucky a few weeks ago. This is where they breed horses. This is where they breed some of the best thoroughbreds. But prior to breeding horses, they were breeding black people. What happened in those breeding farms? They realized that if they could deal with the genetics, if they could manipulate the genetics of a people, if they could mix dirty European genetics, remember, they came over here and they were breathing on people and killing them. This is the germ man. They are responsible for germ warfare. They, they, they are responsible for plagues by just touching you. So if you bred the strong genetics of an African with that of a, a, a recessive European that came out of the caves, right? Serfs, peons, all of these people who were considered the dregs of the world, not society, the world. It's not that they thought the world was flat. It's not that they didn't know where to go. They were not allowed because of maritime law to leave Europe. You think that the Asians didn't know that Europe existed? You think that the Indians did? They just wasn't going there to trade with them. Right, they yeah. were like, why would we? What, wow, what do they got to offer? Right. These were the have not to the planet. Wrong. And they got the nerve to spark. They got the nerve to get out of the pool when one of us would get in the pool. Do you know who brought public baths to Europe? We did. Yep. All right. All right. Do you know who taught them how to wash up? Right. Oh. So the God. nerve of them they to try to, they, they celebrate. Goddamn pilgrim doing in Bed-Stuy. 
on Marcy Avenue right now. What the hell? Nope. What are they doing on 125? They are whitewashing our culture. Right. What happens to the body when it's sick? What shows up? Oh, White blood cells. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they don't get it. They don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> they get it. What happens to the body when it's not alkaline and when it's acidic and it's compromised and your immune system falls down? White blood cells. You now are visited by parasites. Yeah. Right. So if we can't drum anymore in Prospect Park or Harlem, if we can't even have our conversations outside because they're deeming our conversation to be a threat to homeland security, right? If they're making the uh, African attire, a dashiki and other African garb right. be seen subliminally through suggestion because the European rules through fear, he rules through subliminal suggestion, and he rules through bluff. And he rules through his minions by keeping them in power, by them loving him in their hearts and minds. That's how he rules. So if they're, if they're suggesting that African garb and attire is a homeland threat, that means that they're compromising and whitewashing our culture. All right? We have to protect our culture. We got to protect our people financially, economically, culturally, spiritually, physically, and all other ways. Because we can't keep on doing this. We don't have to get in front of the people and convince them that there's a war upon us. There is an economic war upon us that's called regentrification, right? Because economic, if, if, if a European moves into your neighborhood and your rent rolls up 150 yep. percent, but the drugs are still in the neighborhood, right? The crime is still in the neighborhood. You got to step over homeless people in your neighborhood. That is causing stress upon our people. One of the highest causes of death amongst our people is stress yep. and cancer. Like the brother said, they gave us vaccinations in the 60s. Those vaccinations had cancer-causing um, antigens in them that became alive because of what? Stress. GMOs, lead in the water, chemtrails, all of these things activate the vaccinations or the, the enemy that's inside of you. They begin to activate. So they're killing us softly. Like the book said, quiet weapons with silent war. So I'm gonna end it on this right here. The program, the solution that we have is called food, art, arms, clothing, culture, transportation and technology, strategy and shelter is called facts. We're not gonna just deal with the problems we're going to deal with the solutions. You dig what I'm saying? Okay. And that's what we're bringing forward to the people. Next week, me and his brother, San Coco, will be in Connecticut, Waterbury, giving the facts initiative to the family. We're going to be bringing it to Brooklyn, I believe in September or October. Okay. But look out for it. This is your brother, Red Pill. I love the people. I love us. Love you know us. what I mean? Love
instinctively is right and fighting against pedophilia and homosexuality is that we are scared. And that's why I want to say that the reason that I'm so hostile, people think I do that because the only thing I know how to do is know. When I looked at the battlefield, what I saw is we don't have any more examples like Dr. Khan Abdul Muhammad out front. So people like me who prefer to be in the back, that doesn't work because you only a few. The people have to see bravery and see battle in order to get the spirit of battle, then they can follow behind. So that's why we do it the way we do to show people you don't have to be scared.
There's spirits out here that don't want to see this happen. They don't want to see the unification. Please believe me when I tell you that. Pay very close attention. You understand? You got to fight against that because it will always come. There's all kind of monkey wrenches inside of this movement. There's all kind of provocateurs inside of this movement. There's all kind of agents inside of this movement. And the main thing that we have to do in this lifetime while we're alive is to come together for Voltron, okay? Or are we just going to sit back and get on our Facebook and scroll through the atrocities? I'm tired of that. I'm tired of scrolling through this goddamn graveyard of stress and all of the L's that we take it. We don't have to do that. Like he said, when we come together and join forces, that's where our power is at. Outside of America, the black man is God. Make no mistake about that, okay? We gotta come together and we gotta travel and we gotta build. Like I said, in the spirit of Dr. Sabi, health, wealth, knowledge itself. Get your, get your health together. Stop playing games with these Europeans. They're killing you and they're smiling in your face while they're doing it. And you shucking and jiving, eating their fast food, smoking their drugs, sleeping with their women, taking their homosexual agenda, wearing that and putting that outfit on like that's you. All right? And they having a field day laughing at your ass. But they'll love you for the weekend when you win their gold medal. When you represent their Team USA. Definitely. When you make America look good around the world. Knowing that the recessive can't, they can't win the gold. They need the magical Negro to pull it off one more time. Then next week they're going to kill one of us the same old shit. Let's have a debate about getting rid of them. We should just get rid of them. Hip hop, you've been targeted for execution. Your culture is a culture that is seen as expendable in the eyes of the world now. All right? All of the misogynistic shit that you've been doing over the 30 years. All of the, all of the, all of the nigger tree that you've been co-signing and running around the world. All of the drug dealing. All of the gang banging. They have flipped the script, the script, because you don't control your media outside of America. You don't control your image around the world. You don't control your message or your narrative. So what has the ones who control it done? They are doing their best with propaganda and all kind of other things to make you undesirable around the world. So on one hand, the black man is God outside of America. But on the other hand, the black man is undesirable around the world based on religion and all kind of other things that, that are the underlying principles of how this world is going. So we got a lot of work to do, black man. We got to clean these hoods up. We got to clean the industry up. We got to clean the image up. Because yeah. image is power. And that's what we're losing primarily. The way that we dress, the way that we look, even the way that we walk. So, with that being said, we're gonna close out. We got, we have merchandise, we got products. For everybody that's talking about buying black and supporting each other, we here. We don't gotta, we don't gotta participate on. So, the leaders are here, the businesses are here, the revolution and the change is here. Stop looking outside of us. We are here. So that's all I'm saying. Love and light. Peace. Thank you, Brother Santoro. And thank you, Doc, for putting it all together. And remember,